Our next speaker is uh, Professor Andrew Lowe. Andrew is the Charles and Susan Harris Professor of Finance and the Director of the Laboratory for Financial Engineering. This year he was awarded the first ever Eugene Fama Prize for Outstanding Contributions to Doctoral Finance for his book, The Econometrics of Financial Markets. Uh, I'm sure he'll be signing copies outside. <laughs> Andrew's recent research has focused on systemic risk, the dynamics of the hedge fund industry, evolutionary models of behavior, and healthcare finance. His talk today is on how the financial industry can cure cancer. I know this sounds somewhat audacious, but my opinion is a brilliant application of financial intermediation. Andrew, it's all yours. I want to start by thanking Eric for that generous introduction. And, uh, Thanking uh, Antoinette Shore, our, 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 the chair of our group, for uh, organizing this and inviting me to participate. And uh, most of all, thank all of you for coming uh, to this uh, event. You know, we uh, faculty give talks at a lot of different forums, but I have to say that the, 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 the favorite uh, of all of our, uh, all the faculty, is to speak at these uh, MIT alumni events because the energy here is just really palpable. And so um, we appreciate the, the opportunity, uh, particularly to see a number of my former students. I apologize for not being able to say hello to every one of you, um, but uh, thank you for coming. The, the topic that uh, I'm going to talk about today is a little bit unusual, um, particularly for a finance professor. And I have to start with the usual disclaimer. I've been talking about this now for the last two or three years, and I begin all of my talks with the same disclaimer, which is that I am not a healthcare economist. Uh, I have no background in biomedicine. And so really, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, it's important for me to say that because you're, you're likely to ask questions, particularly during the Q&A, and I, I'm going to answer all of these questions, which is, I have no idea. Um, but the difference is that over the course of the last few years, I have actually met a number of people who do have ideas, and I'm going to talk about their ideas over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So I got interested in this topic. Uh, for personal reasons. A number of friends and, and family members uh, were dealing with cancer. And uh, so I started uh, trying to understand a little bit about their situation. And in doing so, um, I couldn't help it, but I started trying to understand a bit more about the underlying economics of cancer therapeutics, the business of, of cancer drug development. And a, a very strange set of facts began to emerge, facts that I didn't fully understand. And I'm not sure I understand today, but maybe I can get your help in trying to interpret some of them. Uh, and it was really through that process that I started focusing on the kind of things that I've been working on for the last two, three years. So let me first start with some motivation. Uh, and the motivation is that uh, biomedicine seems to be at an inflection point right now. Now, again, I'm not qualified to say that, but being at MIT and in Boston, we have a number of experts in biomedicine that are qualified, and based on what they tell me and the buzz that's in the Cambridge-Boston community, this is a time really like no other. And I'll give you just one example of that. So a paper was published back in February, just a few months ago, in Nature, titled Integrative Analysis of 111 Reference Human Epigenomes. Now, you might not know what an epigenome is. I certainly didn't. The whole field of epigenomics is a relatively new area. But this particular paper was really a path-breaking article. And you can tell by the number of authors that uh, <laughs> there was a lot of work involved. Now, you know, in the usual understated, passive-aggressive scientist kind of an approach, the most important author is the last one. Uh, the last author is a fellow by the name of Manolis Kellis, who is a researcher at MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab, as well as in their bioengineering group. And he really shepherded this study that focused not on just genes, but rather on epigenomics, the things that switch genes on and off. And I don't know what this paper means, but I know Manolis, and so I asked him to tell me what it means. And after a half an hour, I started to get an idea. And what's astonishing about this research is that we're now at the point where we're uncovering not just the genetic basis of disease, 
but the actual mechanisms by which these genes are activated and silenced. Now, I can't read this paper, but I can look at the pictures. And uh, it, here's a picture. And it's a table with uh, you know, a heat map of sorts. And if you look on the rows, the labels of the rows are things like Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, Graves' disease, celiac, rheumatoid arthritis. In other words, scientists are now mapping genomics to disease in ways that they've never been able to do before. And this is just one of many examples. Breakthroughs are happening literally every week. This is really unprecedented. And so, so what's the problem? Well, the, the, the conundrum and, and uh, contradiction is that funding for these kinds of activities is actually declining. Now, you might think that's strange, particularly because over the course of the last 12 to 18 months, biotech has become incredibly hot. But what I'm talking about is a combination of public funding for basic science, NIH, as well as the fact that the biotech bubble may be bursting, but more importantly, to get initial funding, Series A funding for startups. It's actually the worst that it's been in about a decade. So if you take a look at the number of active biotech venture capitalists, the ones that are around today are doing well. They're raising money. But actually, in 2008, we had 201 biotech VCs in the United States. And as of a couple of years ago, the number of biotech VCs has gone down to 137. So the kind of Series A financing um, is become harder, becoming harder and harder to come by. And the question about why that is really is what I was grappling with. Why is it the case that we are on the cusp of these incredible breakthroughs when at the same time we're taking money away? And I can't help it as an economist. Uh, I think in economic terms, economic incentives. So my interpretation is it's because of increasing risk and uncertainty. Now, it might be strange to argue that it's because of increasing risk and uncertainty in the face of all of these breakthroughs. But actually, it's because of these breakthroughs that we've got increasing risk and uncertainty. And this is the part that really took me a while to figure out. See, usually, when we think about getting smarter, we think about the risks going down, right? I mean, from the investment community, the more you know about a company, the less risky it is. But it turns out that in biomedicine, the smarter we get, the more pathways to have to explore. And as new discoveries are made, it end up, ends up undermining old therapies that are tried and true. So we're in this situation where, yes, we're getting smarter, but at the same time, we're actually having more difficulties now funding projects because they're getting more expensive, the probabilities of success are going down, and the challenges are, are becoming greater. In other words, increasing complexity is really the problem here. And that's one of the reasons why Series A funding for startups is actually going down despite the fact that the biotech industry looks like it's actually doing better. So I want to just give you a very simple narrative of what the problem is and then suggest uh, a potential solution, a solution that uh, was not mine but has been proposed decades ago. So here's the narrative. A typical cancer drug takes about $200 million in out-of-pocket costs to investigate from beginning to end. Uh, it's a clinical trials process where you have to start with a particular compound and check all of its basic properties for safety and then look for efficacy. You've got to try it in animals first and then you take it to humans. That process can take 10 years. And going through this FDA approval cycle of phase one, phase two, phase three approvals requires $200 million for a single compound from beginning to end. Now, that's not the cost of developing a successful drug. A successful drug takes a number of these trials. So that's why when you read the industry uh, statistics, you get numbers like two to three billion dollars to develop a successful cancer drug. That's comprised of a bunch of $200 million shots, most of which fail. The typical success rate for oncology is about 5%. It takes about 10 years. But in the unlikely event that you are successful, you will earn $2 billion a year in earnings from years 11 to 20, which is about what uh, you have left in your patent life after you get approval. So it takes 10 years, and then you get another 10 years of earnings, 
And so that 10 years of $2 billion a year capitalizes into $12.3 billion of payout in year 10 from a $200 million investment 5% of the time. 95% of the time, you get nothing. So this is what the, the timeline looks like. And the compound rate of return is about 51% per year for that 10-year investment if you're successful. But most of the time, it's minus 100%. For those of you who are in finance at Sloan, let me translate this into terms that you're more comfortable with. That's an expected return of 12% with a standard deviation of 423.5%. <laughs> so how many, of you, how many of you would be willing to invest in this project? Raise your hand. Yeah, no, nobody wants this. This is, this is way too risky. But what if instead of investing in one of these, we invested in a bunch? like? 150 of these. And what if 150 of them were statistically independent, IID, independently and identically distributed? Well, if that's the case, then based upon various concepts in financial engineering, we know that we can actually do a lot better. Actually, with 150 projects in a portfolio, you can actually finance this not just with the traditional tools like venture capital or public equity, you can actually finance it with debt. So let me show you a very basic calculation. If you, if you have 150 programs, each of which cost $200 million, it's true that you will need 150 times 200 or $30 billion. So where are you going to get $30 billion? Well, as an economist, I have a very simple answer for that. Assume we have $30 billion. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. But if we assume we have $30 billion, then, then look at what happens. The probability of at least two successes out of 150 IID trials with a 5% probability, I bet you that a few of you in the audience can actually tell me the number off the top of your head. It turns out that it's 99.59%. In other words, there's a 99.59% probability of at least two successes out of 150 IID trials with a 5% success rate for each. That's simple binomial statistics. So if I've got 99.59% probability of success, that means that 99.59% of the time, I've got 2 times $12.3 billion in year 10. And if I have $2.4 billion in year 10, or $24 billion in year 10, that means that I can actually issue up to $24 billion of 10-year debt. And today's rate at a AA rating of, uh, is about 2.45% as of uh, last week. That means that I can actually get $19.3 billion today in proceeds from that 10-year uh, debt issue. Now, how do I know it's AA? Well, what's the probability of default? It's 1 minus. 99.59%, or 41 basis points, which is right in the AA to AAA category. So I can actually finance almost two-thirds of what I need with debt. And if you allow me to use all the tricks of the financial trade, things like collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, all the things that, that gave us the financial crisis, I could do even better. <laughs> now, you might be asking, is that really a good idea? And I've got to tell you that the way that my co-authors and I started thinking about this was exactly because of the financial crisis. These methods, it's not that they didn't work that caused the crisis. It's because these methods, they work way too well. These are incredibly powerful tools that can be used. And when they're used appropriately, they can create tremendous good. And when they're abused, they can create tremendous devastation. We ought not to throw away the tools. We ought to think about how to use them more responsibly. And this is one way to do that. So um, let me just show you the basic statistics of how this works. I think all of you know this, but it's, again, basic finance. Here's a probability curve for the probability of uh, at least k successes out of 150 trials, if you assume that the projects are uncorrelated. And as I told you, if you look at the very top, the probability of at least two successes is 99.59%, assuming uncorrelated projects. What if the projects are not uncorrelated? What if they're correlated 10%? Well, then the success rate for two projects or more 
goes down to about 96%. If the correlation is at 40%, the success rate goes down to 70%. And if the correlation is as high as 80%, then you're looking at a 30% probability of at least two successes. At that probability, you will not be able to issue any kind of debt. Nobody's going to lend to you uh, with that kind of risk. So what this tells us is that correlation matters. Now, all of you, particularly those who took finance, you know this. You know that correlation matters, and you've got to manage it. So I, I was talking to a pharma executive about this, and he said, you know, this is exactly what he's been telling his senior management, but he hasn't been able to get the message across. And he said that he first came across this notion when he was coaching his daughter's third grade soccer team. Soccer's been in the news recently, uh, and so we're all <laughs> thinking about it. But apart from the corruption that you've got to deal with, the tougher problem is how you deal with people crowding around the ball. As a third grade soccer coach, this is what your soccer players look like. They're all around the ball. And so you've got to tell the kids, spread out, spread out. Go to where the ball will be, not where the ball is. And when you compare this to World Cup soccer, irrespective of corruption, the soccer players are all spread out. Finance tells you to do the right thing. And in fact, by diversifying across different therapeutic uh, pathways, methods, and mechanisms, you not only can reduce the risk, but you increase the possibility of tremendous amounts of financing. These ideas aren't new. You know that they're not new, uh, because many of you who were taking 15401, or back then, 15415, with our next speaker, you knew that the methods were invented by him and his colleagues. That's many of the, many of the reasons you came to Sloan and why I came to Sloan. So uh, these methods uh, not being new, you might think that uh, they're sort of obvious. They're not obvious in the biopharma industry, at least not since I've been able to uh, ascertain that. The way that I came across this was really in a very personal way. My mother, uh, before she died, uh, had non-small cell lung cancer. And so I was starting to try to understand a little bit about the experimental therapeutics that were available to patients with that type of cancer. And a colleague of mine was very kind to introduce me to a biotech firm in Cambridge, a very successful biotech company that was developing experimental therapies for non-small cell lung cancer. So the chief scientific, of, uh, chief scientific officer was very gracious to meet with me. And he brought along his uh, chief financial officer. So the two of them and I had lunch. And during the course of the lunch, I asked them what I thought was a relatively innocent question. I asked them, does your source of financing influence at all your scientific agenda, you know, which particular mechanisms or uh, therapeutics you decide to pursue. And they looked at each other, laughed an ironic laugh, and turned back to me and said, influence. Our financing drives our scientific agenda. And I got to tell you that as the son of a patient, I was really outraged by that. I mean, it sounded like the stupidest thing in the world because what does stock market volatility, Fed policy, and interest rates have to do with whether you can cure cancer by angiogenesis or immunotherapy? Nothing. But it drives the scientific agenda. I understand why. Things got to be paid for. But shouldn't the science drive the finance rather than the other way around? And so that's what my co-authors and students and I have been working on to try to figure out, uh, can we do that? And the short answer is, we have no idea. Um, but we were very fortunate to come across people who do. And so the question of, do we really need $30 billion? Well, the answer is, it kind of depends on things that you would expect that it would depend on. So at this point, we've written a series of papers where we've run Monte Carlo simulations using software that we developed and we posted online. And we have an open source license for anybody to take it, steal it, do whatever you like with it, play with it to run various simulations under various kinds of assumptions about the cost of development, probability of success, uh, various kinds of pricing scenarios to calculate what the appropriate rates of return are and the kinds of financing that you need in order to be able to make this an economically viable alternative. So most recently, in a paper that we published in Science Translational Medicine, that's a journal that I'd never heard of until about a year ago, but apparently it's a pretty decent journal. We actually did a collaboration with uh, NIH and the particular part of NIH that focuses on rare and neglected diseases. 
diseases like hemophilia uh, or uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, uh, things that you might not be able to pronounce, but for a very small patient population uh, are actually pretty significant uh, diseases. And we looked at rare diseases because we know what happened in the financial crisis that made all of these models break. It was the correlations that we didn't take into account because historically the correlations were small and then all of a sudden they became not so small. Well, so we decided that we were gonna focus on rare diseases, particularly rare genetic disorders, because by definition, the success or failure of those kinds of uh, drug development projects are gonna be uncorrelated because the diseases are genetic mutations that are random. And so if any kind of portfolio would satisfy the assumptions of IID, it would be rare diseases. What we showed with the NCADS data, they actually have a portfolio of 28 projects that they are taking from the basic research phase to the point where they can get into the clinic and venture capitalists can take that and move it along the pipeline. Of those 28 projects, we analyzed the data that they provided us with and showed that if you had simulated a portfolio of maybe $500 million, not 30 billion, but 500 million, and you only had 20 projects, not 150, you're looking at a rate of return on the order of about 22% IRR, which seems pretty attractive from my perspective. And the way that that works is actually pretty simple. It turns out that uh, developing drugs for rare diseases is a very different proposition than developing drugs for uh, major kinds of cancer or Alzheimer's. It turns out that the probability curve for, say, 20 projects, it looks pretty dismal if the correlation uh, is zero, but the probability of success is 5%, as it is in oncology. But it turns out that for rare genetic disorders, because it's rare, it turns out that the scientific mechanisms can actually be identified pretty easily. So for rare diseases, the probability of success is not 5%. If it goes up to 10%, then the probability of at least two successes goes up to 60. If it's 15%, the probability goes up to 80. And some people argue that the probability of success is 20% or larger. At 20%, you're now looking at a 96% probability. At that point, you can start raising debt financing. And we're talking, again, not about 30 billion, but 500 million or less. Can you earn a decent rate of return, though, because you have such small patient populations? Well, something amazing is happening in biomedicine today, which is what I call, this is not their term, this is my term. Uh, I'm in a management school, so I have to come up with snappy terms. So my term is orf the orphanization of all disease. It turns out that diseases are becoming orphanized, they're becoming rare, rarefied, because of genetic screening. So for example, these are all drugs some of which you may have heard of, that are rare disease drugs. For example, did you know that breast cancer was a rare disease? Now, how could that be? 230,000 women get breast cancer every year. 30,000 women die of it every year. How could that be a rare disease? Well, it turns out that the 1983 Orphan Drug Act defines a rare disease as a disease that affects 200,000 patients or less. And it turns out that for a particular population, Herceptin will work very well, and for other populations, it won't. And that population, which is identified by genetic screening, happens to be less than 200,000. So Herceptin was approved as a rare disease drug, and it was expedited through the process thanks to that 1983 Orphan Drug Act. You can earn a terrific rate of return on these products. So let me now uh, give you the bad news. The bad news is that for certain diseases, $30 billion is not nearly enough. And I'll give you an example. Let's start with cancer as a point of comparison, because cancer does have a lot of drugs out there, and there are some successes that we can talk about. So uh, if you compare Alzheimer's to cancer, you'll see that, that what I'm getting at. Does anybody have a guess as to how many new cancer drugs were approved since 2012? So that's about 30 months. Over the last 30 months, how many new cancer drugs were approved by the FDA? Now, you know that the, uh, approving a drug is not a, uh, a common event, right? It takes years and years of development, and billions of dollars get spent. And then, you know, if the FDA decides to approve it, that's a, a, big, a big piece of news. So what would you guess? How many, how many cancer drugs do you think got approved over the last 30 months? One? Five? Ten? Try 27. 27 drugs in 30 months. Amazing, right? 
Okay, so let's talk about Alzheimer's, which is a pretty serious disease. Five million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's right now. How many new Alzheimer's drugs were approved in that same time span? Anybody know? Two? One? Yeah, try zero. How about in 2011? Zero. How about 2010? Zero. How about 2009? Well, how about if we go way back until 2003 was the last time there was a drug approved, and it wasn't even for Alzheimer's, it was for symptoms, memory loss. Over a decade, we have not had a single Alzheimer's drug, despite the fact that five million Americans suffer from it, and this year, Medicare and Medicaid will spend $200 billion in direct costs, medical costs, not the cost of care, but the actual cost of medication and doctor's visits for Alzheimer's. Why? Why are we so bad at Alzheimer's when we're so good at cancer? And the answer is because we just don't know enough about Alzheimer's biology. The science of Alzheimer's disease is not as well developed. In a paper that we published last year in Science Translational Medicine, we did a simulation, a, a mega fun simulation for Alzheimer's, and we showed that, well, first of all, uh, you don't even have enough targets to focus on, but even if you did, it would cost more like $100 billion, not $30 billion, in order to get the success rate to the point where you might be able to get some reasonable rate of return. Uh, however, it turns out that um, if you could invest in the basic science of Alzheimer's biology, that would be more likely to produce targets that would ultimately turn into commercializable products. The problem is that the private sector will not do this because you can't earn a rate of return on basic science. And so what this shows us is that we need to have the ecosystem working together, all the parts working, and one of the critical parts is basic scientific funding. So that's something that we didn't expect to come out of our analysis, but it turns out that it's actually a pretty important piece, an, an example of which Alzheimer's, I think, is the leading case. So let me start to wrap up because I want to leave some time for q and I suspect that uh, there are a number of people in the audience that know a heck of a lot more about this than I do. Let me just answer a couple of questions that are probably in the minds of many of you, which is, isn't pharma doing this already? Why do we need to get involved? I mean, that's what a drug company is. Isn't it a portfolio of drugs? And the answer is a little complicated. It's, yes, yeah, sort of. They were doing it, but they're doing less of it now. And it's because it's getting a lot harder to do it. So let me give you an example. Case in point, Pfizer, one of the largest drug companies in the world, they have $36 billion in cash sitting on their balance sheets. And of that $36 billion, $31.5 billion is actually financed by long-term debt. So if you look on their balance sheets, Pfizer actually looks like one of these big mega funds, right? So why doesn't Pfizer invest in 150 projects. Well, they've got lots of projects, certainly, but what Pfizer has been doing is what many of these pharma companies have been doing. They basically keep this cash in order to invest, not in early stage translational medicine, but to, to buy other companies after the risk has been taken out of them. And why are they doing it? Because we're telling them to do it as shareholders. So 19, in 2010, Morgan Stanley produced a research report uh, about the pharmaceutical industry, and the title is Exit Research and Create Value. In fact, in this report, they have a rather cheeky uh, uh, solution, uh, which is our economic value added analysis supports replacing research with search. On current market economics, we estimate that a dollar invested in in-licensed compounds will on average deliver three times as much value as a dollar invested in in-house research. We're telling them to get out of the drug development business and get into the drug approval and distribution and marketing business. And they're doing it. They're doing it by laying off people in the R&D space and by making deals with biotech companies after the risk has been eliminated. So here's an example. Uh, Sanofi uh, announced just a few weeks ago that they're putting in $845 million in a joint venture with Voyager Therapeutics, a very successful biotech company uh, in Cambridge. That's the good news. On the same day that they announced this, they also announced, hey, we're gonna lay off 100 research people in Boston. 
and it's because it's not because they're incompetent. It's not because pharma executives don't know what they're doing. It's because the science has gotten so much more complicated. We don't know now where the breakthroughs are going to come. And no single company has on its staff all of the brilliant people that will make those kind of breakthroughs. In fact, the chances are the next breakthrough will not happen in your company. It'll happen somewhere else. And so it's very difficult for them to manage it. And in order to satisfy shareholders, maintain their earnings, reduce volatility, they're getting out of the early stage business and getting into the later stage uh, business, which they're good at and which is much more difficult for uh, the biotech models to do. So as a result, we're in transition now. The science is developing rapidly. The business opportunities have not yet caught up in terms of how to take advantage of them. And so we see new business models emerging. And the business models that ultimately we think require, uh, are required to be able to take these uh, opportunities really aren't part of pharma. They're not part of biotech VC. They're not a mutual fund, but they contain elements of all of these things. And it's really because, in the end, drug discovery is not a single business. It's more like three or four different businesses with different levels of expected returns, different risks, different natural investors, and different ways of taking advantage of them. Ultimately, we actually have to think differently about this and build a new business model to deal with it. The closest business model that we have right now to what a mega fund can do is something called a drug royalty investment company. And the best example of this is a company called Royalty Pharma. This is a company that buys approved drugs uh, and uh, basically licenses the royalty streams and pays cash in exchange. They're a finance company, but they actually provide uh, tremendous value in unlocking intellectual property and allowing these academic medical centers and pharma companies to be able to recycle their cash. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I want to deal with one final issue, uh, which is how these companies are actually raising the money. So something very significant happened just a few weeks ago. A form, uh, some former executives from Elon Pharmaceuticals decided to create a new fund to invest in early stage research uh, and development in the life sciences. They decided instead of doing the usual VC route, they would do an IPO. Now, how can you do an IPO when you don't have anything to invest in? You're going to invest. Well, it turns out that you can now do this in Ireland. So Malin, the company that did the IPO, they raised 330 million euros. And what did they say about their business model? We're going to acquire majority or significant minority equity positions in private, pre-IPO, pre-trade sale operating businesses in the life sciences industry. In other words, trust us, and we'll take it from here. And who knows whether they'll be successful, but this is a new financing model for the industry. And the business development corporation uh, model, that can actually be something that is done here in the US. Uh, now, Ireland did invest 50 million euros of its own money from the government as part of this to get, get it going. But nonetheless, they raised the other uh, uh, 270 million euros from investors. So I want to tell you about another model and then wrap up. Another model is how philanthropy can play a role. And this has to do with a really interesting model uh, by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Cystic fibrosis is a rare disease uh, that uh, is a genetic mutation that uh, causes your lung function to, be, um, uh, to, to, to uh, be incapacitated. You develop thick mucus in your lungs. And by the time you're in your 30s, you are pretty much uh, dead. And so it turns out that uh, there's no known drug to deal with it, at least uh, at, in 1998, when the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation uh, invested in uh, a drug development program with a biotech company called uh, Vertex. Actually, it was originally Aurora Bio Biosciences. It was then acquired by Vertex. Over the course of about five or six years, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which is not a big foundation, it had assets of probably you know, $180, $200 million at the time. Over the course of several years, they invested $150 million uh, in Vertex uh, slash Aurora. Now, I say invested because they didn't just give them grant money. They said, we're going to give you money, but we want royalties to the drug if and when it ever gets approved. And both Aurora and Vertex was happy to take money from this particular organization because they knew that these folks were actually looking not to make a short, quick profit. They really wanted to change the landscape for therapeutics for cystic fibrosis. So they stuck with it. 
Over the course of several years, they kept putting in more money and doubling down until they had put in this $150 million. In 2012, Kaleidico was approved. It's a drug, the first drug ever to be able to deal with cystic fibrosis in a material way. It doesn't cure it, but it actually does a lot to reduce the symptoms and allows people to, to live quite a bit longer. Unfortunately, it only works for about 6% of cystic fibrosis patients. You got it, those patients that have certain particular genetic markers. Now, that's part of the story. The other part of the story is that they sold their interest in this drug, Kaleidico, just last year. And they sold it to Royalty Pharma, this company that provides investments in revenue streams. They sold it for $3.3 billion. $3.3 billion. Now, the upside of this is even more upside. Since Royalty Pharma acquired this uh, portfolio of uh, intellectual property, a second drug for cystic fibrosis was approved, was just approved by the pa review panel uh, a couple of weeks ago. The, in July, the FDA will, will uh, take formal approval of it. This second stage of the development program looks like it's gonna actually help 60% of the cystic fibrosis patients, not just six. So it's an incredible story that really comes about because of novel financing methods. So can the financial industry cure cancer? Again, I'm not qualified to say, but I think with some imagination today, you can actually easily see how that's possible. So let me ask you to imagine along with me and see whether or not you would be willing to invest under the right circumstances. So imagine if we actually created a $30 billion fund to cure cancer. Now I know that oncologists don't like to use the word cure because cancer is a disease that evolves and it can come back with a vengeance, but let's say for the sake of argument, we are actually gonna go after cures. And with $30 billion, we might be able to do that. Imagine creating an incredible board of advisors, uh, business advi oh, excuse me, projects, uh, incredible projects from MIT, uh, maybe even from Harvard, uh, from a few other organizations. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, medical centers, we get the pharma companies involved. Imagine that all of these organizations were gonna contribute projects to this portfolio, and imagine that we're gonna actually be able to create advisory board that consists of people on the scientific side like Lou Cantley, George Dimitri, Bob Langer, Eric Lander, and so on and so forth, and on the business side, people like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, uh, Bob Merton, and so on. Imagine that we had that board, and imagine that we actually had a, a major uh, mutual fund complex offer the fund. Imagine if we had that fund. How many of you would be willing to invest a one-time investment of $3,000 of your 401k in a fund like this? Now before you answer, before you answer, let me leave you with one final uh, story to motivate you. It's a story that I came across quite by accident. It's a story about a colleague of mine uh, at the Whitehead Institute, um, Harvey Lodish. He's a cell biologist, not a drug developer. But I have to tell you that after hearing his story, I want to be Harvey Lodish. And let me tell you why. So in 1986, Harvey was approached by a venture capitalist to help develop a drug for a rare disease, uh, Gaucher's disease. It's a genetic mutation that uh, causes you to not be able to produce a certain enzyme. And so you have to replace that enzyme. And as a cell biologist uh, with some particular expertise on uh, behavior of cell membranes, Harvey's expertise was critical in helping to develop a drug which got approved in 1992, and they started a company that became quite successful. You may have heard of it. It's called Genzyme. And, uh, but that's not the interesting part of the story. That's not why I want to be Harvey Lodish. It's because in 1992, the drug got approved, but in 2002, Harvey's daughter became pregnant with her first child, uh, Harvey's first grandson. And in utero, this baby was diagnosed with Gaucher syndrome. Now, you don't necessarily get the disease even though you have the genes for it. You have to wait until you're in puberty. And uh, so when Harvey's grandson, Andrew, turned 10, he ended up coming down with Gaucher's disease. And he's doing just fine, thank you very much, because of grandpa's drug. It's an amazing story. When Harvey developed it, he had no idea that, that that he was carrying the genes for this disease. Remember, in 1986, we were nowhere near even completing or thinking about sequencing the human genome. And so that's why I want to be Harvey Lodish. 
but I can't. I don't have a PhD in cell biology, but I can if I invest in a fund that develops cures for my as yet to be born grandchildren. So now let me ask you, how many of you would invest $3,000? <laughs> yeah. I only needed 8% of you to raise your hand because with 8% with, with of the population uh, of 130 million households at $3,000, I've got my 30 billion. So with your help, with the financial industry's help, I think we can cure cancer. And I know that it's a little bit troubling to be talking about finance and life and death issues. My mother died of cancer, so I get it. It can be viewed as being obscene and offensive. But the problem is that if we don't, if we don't focus on financial engineering, we're not going to get the resources we need to be able to deal with this problem. The challenges are just too big for us to be able to handle. And so I'll just leave you with the final thought that um, it is possible to do well by doing good, and that finance doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. And if you have any doubt about that, if you have any questions about where that comes from or how we can deal with it, uh, stick around because our next speaker will tell you he invented the field and uh, he'll be able to demonstrate to you exactly how this is done. Thank you. Andrew, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a son that's a cancer survivor, and I happen to be a CDO trader, so I love the idea. But I, I would ask, before investing, like, how much of the oil exploration company problem could you have in that? How stable is that $2 billion payout, given that you're looking 10, 12 years in the future? So uh, you know, again, I'm not qualified to answer, but that's a question that I had. So I asked a number of experts about this. And there are lots of complex issues to deal with, including pricing. As we know, there's a lot of pressure now on drug companies about whether or not they can price at market. And uh, that's got to be factored in. So based upon the conversations that I've had, uh, the feeling is that 10 years ago, the answer would have been no way. You could have not gotten any numbers on what the risks and expected rates of return are. But a lot's happened since 10 years. And the, the two things that's happened are big data and bioinformatics. So now we have a much sharper understanding of the patient population, the kind of risks that are involved, the mechanisms by which we're going to be developing drugs, and the probability of success. And we're, when you're dealing with life-threatening diseases like cancer, the view is that you are going to be able to make a really nice profit. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're dealing with uh, you know, curing, I don't know, athlete's foot, uh, $30 billion might very well be able to cure athlete's foot, but you're probably not going to be able to earn a decent rate of return on that $30 billion. But with life-threatening disorders, rare diseases, things that affect you know, hundreds of millions of patients around the world, the view is that um, you know, the economics are going to work just fine. Yes. Hi. Hi, Dr. Liu. Thank you for uh, presenting. My name is Melody Rollins. I'm a Sloan 01 graduate. Um, I like the beginning of the talk about all the financial engineering and, um, and then how the Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation was able to turn its investment into uh, big money. Have you ever thought about um, some kind of structured product where the equity or first last tranche is foundation money? Yes. Um, OK, I want to hear about that. And then the second part is, how do you um, ensure commitment and credibility among that advisory board who's picking the 150 projects, you know, from an investor's perspective, if it's not their money they're spending, you wonder about the quality of their commitment. Right. So, yeah, so th th those are two great points. With respect to the first point, um, not only uh, have we thought about it, but it's actually already been done in the sense that the Gates Foundation, for example, has actually financed certain uh, uh, drugs for infectious diseases, and they've agreed to take first loss positions uh, in the equity. Uh, and we've also written a paper where we show that uh, using credit default, the equivalent of credit default swaps, you can actually have patient advocacy groups uh, provide guarantees and therefore maximize the impact that their dollars could have 
uh, to be able to, to uh, get these drugs approved. Uh, a recent paper by a Chicago economist named Tom Phillipson uh, has actually proposed, uh, proposed the, uh, the development of FDA swaps that allow people to insure against bad FDA outcomes. So I think that's all part of the financial innovation. And it's, it's all stuff that was developed, uh, as I said, by you know, people at MIT years, decades ago. So you know, it, in general, these are well-known techniques that you know, people in the industry have been using for, uh, for many years. Um, with respect to your second point about picking projects and more importantly, killing projects, that's actually one of the reasons that people have argued that pharma has not been as productive as they could be. It's that once you are part of the large corporate mentality, it's inevitable that you fall in love with your own scientists and your own projects. It's very hard for you to have that 30,000 foot view that says, you know what, uh, angiogenesis is really not where it's at. You ought to go focus on immunotherapy for a little bit and then see what you come up with. So having that fund that plays that role of being able to look out over the entire industry and pick projects and kill projects as needed, that's an argument of why a fund structure like this could actually add value to the industry. Hi, I can um, see Adrian you. Adrian uh, Yes. I'm actually a PhD graduate. Um, with the hope in the advent of personalized medicine, so basically uh, genomics-based individualized cures, doesn't the whole um, economic structure of how much it costs to develop and then to market a drug change uh, dramatically? It does. And Again, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not smart enough to figure out how it changes uh, because there's so many different moving parts. But let me talk about two of those parts that may give you some comfort. First, um, personalized medicine means that now we're developing drugs not for a huge population but for a smaller population. Uh, that might seem like bad news, but there's a couple of good news aspects to it. One is that when you divide and conquer the patient population through genetic screening, what that does is that that reduces the correlations, doesn't it? It allows you to actually have more projects that have less correlation than trying to blast the drug out to all the patients. So that's good. Orphanizing disease is good in that respect. Now what about charging money? Well, if you can actually produce a drug that's really effective in a small patient population, the experience so far is that payers will pay. So I'll give you an example. The poster child for this phenomenon is a company called Alexion Pharmaceuticals. How many people have heard of Alexion? Well, I never heard of it until relatively recently. It's a company that was started about 15, 20 years ago in New Haven, Connecticut by a Yale professor and some venture capitalists. And it produces a drug, one drug, called Solaris. And it's a drug for a rare disease called paroxysmal noctur nocturnal hemoglobinuria, that I mentioned before. It's a blood disorder that by the time you're in your 20s, you're dead. Um, and so it's a, it's a terminal illness that this drug will basically turn into a chronic manageable condition. So it's a lifesaver, without a doubt. Um, this drug costs $440,000 a year. There are approximately, I think, 25,000 patients in the US, maybe you know, 100,000 in the world. It's rare, rare disease. Alexion Pharmaceuticals uh, last year earned $3 billion from this one drug. And they have a $25, million, $25 billion market cap. They were added to the S&P 500 last year, it's one drug. Now you might ask, is this sustainable? Can we really do this for all these different diseases? Uh, no, of course not, it's not sustainable. So let's break the system. Let's actually get it to the point where we're spending so much money that people say, we can't possibly do this. We've got to do this in a better way. And meanwhile, you'll end up curing lots of diseases. That sounds good to me. One last question. Oh. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Bob. Yeah, in the last two years, there's probably been over 100 IPOs of biotech companies raising seven, eight billion dollars. Have you looked at the aggregate of all that to try and figure out mathematically whether that group is going to get anywhere near the type of returns that you're expecting? Is it, in other words, is the marketplace just starting to do this not in a structured form but in an individual yeah. company by company form where the aggregate gets to your purpose? Well, so there's no doubt that money has come back into the space that really had left uh, you know, 10 years ago. And many people would argue it left for good reason. 
because the rates of return that was produced by the first biotech bubble in the early, late 1990s and early 2000s, that was very disappointing in the mid 2000s, so that's why money left the space. The problem is that money is coming back in the space, but it's coming back much later in the pipeline. So you, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of IPOs and a lot of buyouts by various pharma M&A transactions. Those are uh, transactions that have occurred after the risk of drug development has largely been reduced to the point where public markets are actually able to digest them. The real need, the bottleneck right now, is in the early stages. And based upon the analysis that we've done and the conversations we've had, money is not only not coming into the space, but it's actually going out of the space. And it's because it's getting harder, more expensive, and the probabilities uh, are, in some cases, lower because of the complexities of the research that's happening. So for certain hot areas, money is coming in, but it's coming in you know, at phase two, phase three, and after drugs are approved. Royalty Pharma, a lot of the biotech VCs in Boston are actually raising money and have raised money. Uh, but they're not investing at the early stages. They're investing at the later stages. So where this idea can really help is to create a mega fund investing in university IP, but across lots of different universities and with IP agreements that will actually give investors a reasonable rate of return. If we can do that, I, I think all of us can agree that, that the, the real breakthroughs are, are yet to come and will be tremendously profitable. We just don't know what universally it'll come through, so let's invest in all of them. It's basically the idea of an index fund. We can't pick stocks, so let's not try. Let's just invest in all of them. Thank, Thank you, Thank Andrew. you very much. Thank you.